this up just a little bit. All right, tonight we're in Genesis again, in Genesis chapter 4, and uh, beyond the garden, death and murder, and uh, kind of a grim uh, thing to talk about, but it is what happened with Cain and Abel. And we're in chapter 4, and verse number 8. Genesis chapter 4, verse number 8. Let me grab a clock. Make sure that we uh, run right on time. Verse number 8, And Cain talked with his brother, and it came to pass that when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. And so we first see the deception of Cain. He tries lying to God. Boy, don't we all experience that in our lives. We like to explain away the wrong that we do. Uh, I know I do in my life. I like to say, well, there's nothing really that wrong with it. I find that I don't compare myself to his holiness as I do uh, as much as I do someone else's holiness. Well, I'm better than them and everybody's doing it. And, you know, we often talk to teenagers about that. And I remember a mother would say, if everybody jumped off a cliff, would you jump too? Or jumped off a bridge, would you jump too? But really, that never leaves us. That peer pressure is always there, trying to keep up uh, with friends and family and, and following their leadership. Well, we have to differentiate between um, following someone and holiness and then also we have to know that there is there are some people that we're likening ourselves to because they've lowered the bar. The, the, if I were to uh, say tonight, um, actually I can't think of one person here that I'd want to race. I was going to say, if I were to say I would like to race somebody, if anybody wants to race, I'm not going to pick... Um, you folks that are fast and, and super athletic. I'm going to pick somebody else, but frankly, I'm looking around the auditorium, and uh, this body wasn't made for running. And uh, if, uh, if I run, it's usually because something's chasing me. But one way or another, kind of lowering the bar. We don't want to compare ourselves to others, and we don't want to try to lie to God by doing that. And so some people will lie to God by saying, well, he convicts me, but I'm going to do it my way. It's not that bad. But at some point you have to ask yourself, who are you arguing with? Who, when you're laying in bed and you think you've done something that might not be right, and you're mulling it over in your head and you're saying, there's nothing wrong with it. And you're having this big argument. Any of you have arguments in your head? Nobody? Okay, few. Sister Calvin, at some point we finally say, wait a second, who am I arguing with? My flesh likes it, so I'm not arguing with me. Is it so righteous that the devil doesn't want me to do it? Well, no, that's not the devil. Is everybody in the world doing it? Well, yes. So if the world, the flesh, and the devil are for it, and I'm still arguing, hmm, I wonder who I'm arguing with. My flesh says I like it. The devil likes it. The world likes it. But there's one who's inside you. The Holy Spirit of God saying, oh, no, no, no. Don't argue with the Holy Spirit. Say, well, if the Holy Spirit's convicting me about it, I'll yield. I'll just yield. We were, um, I took judo for some time. And judo was a lot of fun. You Throw people all over the place. It was a lot of fun. I was just a little guy. And um, let me rephrase that. I've never been a little guy. I was a youngster. And um, there weren't any ladies there that night. And so the sensei came in, say, take off your geese. And we're going to, since it's just all boys, we're going to go without your tops. We'll do judo that way so you don't have anything to grab hold of but arms. And I was kind of weirded out. Um, grabbing another guy with your, out your shirt on, that's just weird. But he said do it, so we did it. He shut the curtains. We're all in there, and we're going 
guys, and he gave me a real sweaty kid. Just sweaty, sweaty. And he said, you go against him. I was like, ah. And I went to throw him, and my hand went up his sweaty back. And it's just like, I could just feel it, you know? It's not really happening, but you can feel it just dripping from your arm. And I go, <laughs> about threw my arm out of socket, came off his back so fast. And he takes me down, wham, on my back. And he puts, to pin somebody, you put your, we would go like this, and of course we're laying on the ground, and we pin them by the head. You know what? When your head is here, it's right next to that armpit. <laughs> it's some bit of nasty. And my son say, goes, kick out, come on, John, kick out, kick out, kick out. I said, no, sir, I'm pinned. And he said, come on, you're not even trying. I'm trying, I'm done. He got me. I'm done. You know what? I gave up. Some people fight with the Holy Spirit their entire life. It never works out well for them. They fight him and fight him and fight him. But the Holy Spirit only wants what's best in your life. The Word of God isn't to cage you in. It's to give you freedom. Drugs don't give you freedom. Uh, alcohol doesn't give you freedom. Uh, adultery doesn't give you freedom. All these lying doesn't give you freedom. Theft doesn't give you freedom. Murder doesn't give you freedom. And God says don't do any of those. Amen. Why? Because he wants you to have all the freedom you can. He doesn't want you chained to anything. And so, um, a long time spent on that little bit, but he was a deceiver, and he deceived his own self. I believe came to came to the place where he was deceiving himself. Abel got what he deserved. I believe that's really what Cain thought. Abel got what was coming to him. And then he lied to God. And so let's go on. Am I my brother's keeper? Wow, so many messages have been preached on that. And he said, what hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth, earth which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. Wow, that's powerful. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. And Cain said unto the Lord, Selfish Cain, my punishment is greater than I can bear. What would you think Cain might have said at this point? I'll let you answer. Here comes the punishment. What do you think Cain might have said there? Noah. Um, maybe. No. No, thank you for not taking my life. Okay. Seth. Boom! Oh, God, I am so sorry. You have brought before my face my sin. What did David do? Father, forgive me. And he wept. And he knew the punishment was coming. That's not Cain. He was still so self-centered and so selfish and egotistical that he tells God, your punishment is too harsh and it's more than I can handle. Well, let's go on. Let me get into my notes before I give everything away. Cain's true character is now seen. He is a child of the devil. In 1 John 3, 12, it says that. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother, brother, and wherefore slew he him because he, because his own works were evil and his brothers were righteous. Why did he do it? Because his brother was righteous and he was evil, and that battle still goes on today. Why did the Bible 
uh, say he was of the wicked one because he was uh, a murderer and he was a liar. He was sinful. Though he would not practice deception, oh, I'm sorry, though he would practice deception, he was unable to hide his actions nor hide his heart from God. Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known. I want you to know that before God, the Bible says we are all naked before God. There is nothing you're going to hide from him. Cain thought, I will lie to God and he won't know. Oh, there are a lot of people you can hide the truth from. But God sees everything. He knows my down sitting. He knows my uprising. If I go into heaven, behold, thou art there. If I go make my bed in hell, thou art there. I cannot get away from the eyes of God. They see me when I'm alone. They see me when that bad thing pops up on my email. And I click it. He sees me when that picture pops up and I should quickly delete it and be disgusted, but I'm not. And he sees me lust. He sees my anger. He sees my malice. He sees my God. Everything that I do, evil God sees. But the wonderful thing is, we have Abel on the flip side. The wonderful thing is that he saw Abel and honored his faith and honored his sacrifice. He accepted the sacrifice. And the wonderful thing is he accepted Abel. That's wonderful. Sometimes we get this idea that reaping and, or sowing and reaping is only negative. In the life of Cain and Abel, and through this lesson tonight, you're going to hear a lot of negative. It's pretty terrible. But don't forget that Abel had his reward. The man did it for evil. God still gave Abel his reward. I think of Joseph, and, and I, I'm getting way off track, but I'm going to anyway. I talked to Brother Gamble about this um, this afternoon and some others um, this past week because it's been on my mind and heart so much. Here is Joseph, and God gives him a dream. He knows what his brothers will do with that dream. He knew the jealousy of Joseph's brothers. He knew the favoritism of Joseph's father. God did not cause either one of them to sin. He knew what they would do. He knew about the well before the well happened. He knew about slavery before the slavery happened. He knew about Potiphar before Potiphar happened. He knew about Potiphar's wife before that happened. He knew that he would be forgotten by the butler before that happened. All these things that happened to Joseph, God knew about, but he did not cause it all. So he goes through all these hardships because of the sin of men. Does God tempt men to sin? Has God ever tempted a man to sin? No. And here Joseph is in prison. I probably would have thrown in the towel by now. But Joseph didn't. And God saw his faithfulness. And he said, now Joseph, here's all the evil of this world. Now I'm going to get involved. Now I'm going to lift you up higher than you could have dreamt. You will have the beauty and riches of Egypt. But oh, they won't even compare to the reward in heaven. And he honored his faithfulness. So maybe you're here tonight and you're being faithful and maybe you're tired of it. Maybe you're weary and well-doing. Oh, don't give up. You'll reap if you faint not. I say all that because with Cain we see... All this negative and weighty stuff about sin. And it is true. If you walk away from the Lord, if you sin, his judgment is coming. Oh, be assured, his judgment's coming. But if you serve him, and love him, and are faithful to him, even through hardship, he still has something at the end of the road. He still has something there.
All right, let's get back into the lesson. It is important to notice that God directly or indirectly by way of his messengers often questions people to give them the opportunity to confess or repent. I find it very interesting there we go that God comes to Cain and he doesn't say you low down sinner I know what you did. Did you notice what he said? Let's go back a couple of slides. And verse number nine. And the Lord said to Cain, knowing full well the answer, where is Abel thy brother? I find it very interesting that God continually gives his people and the unsaved a chance to confess. He could have just pronounced judgment. As soon as Abel fell to the ground, God could have stepped up and judgment could have come down on Cain. But he doesn't. He comes to Cain again and he says, where is your brother Cain? Well, what was he doing? He's given him a chance to repent and confess. We see it all throughout the Word of God, and maybe the Holy Spirit does that to your life. Over and over again, He does it in my life. What about this, John? What about this, John? What about this, John? What about this in your life, John? And I'm convicted about it. And He questions Cain and gives him an opportunity, but Cain, of course, lies. And God, and with Adam and Eve, He did it there. Um, God with Cain. He questioned them there. Of course, in uh, Adam and Eve, it was, um, uh, who has told you thou art naked? Did you eat of the tree? And then with God, with Saul to Paul, um, that's Acts 26, 14. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Is it Paul? It is hard for thee to kiss against the prick and that's talking about the the ox goes and so what's he do he touches Saul with a question to bring him to reason to confess and to repent Jesus at the woman of the, with the woman at the well he doesn't necessarily say it in the form of a question but he did ask her to go get her husband and that's what he wanted was asking her what about your husband? What about the sin in your life? Then P Peter with um, Ananias and Sapphira. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thy heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back the part of the price of the land? So now God indirectly deals with um, Ananias, doesn't he? He uses Peter to ask him the question. Why are you lying to God? And then Ananias pays the price immediately. It was rhetorical with Ananias. But then Sapphira, his wife, comes in, and we see um, the young men have carried him out and buried him in verse number 6. And then uh, verse number 7. And it was about the space of three hours when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. And Peter answered unto her, Tell me... Whether ye sold the lamb for so much. And she did. She said, yea, for so much. What was Peter giving her the opportunity to do? Confess and repent. You know, God didn't even ask him for all of the money. It was the fact that they were lying to God and to man about their giving. They were being hypocritical and lying. And God's judgment came down on both of them. Then we see Samuel with Saul. Samuel with Saul in uh, 1 Samuel 13, 9. And Saul said, bring hither to me the burnt offering and the peace offering. And he offered the burnt offering. And it came to pass that as soon as he made an end of the offering, the burnt, made end of offering, the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came and Saul went out to meet him. 
that he might salute him. And Samuel said, What hast thou done? Confess, Saul, you did the job of the priest. You did what you weren't supposed to do. Confess! I find that working with young people, that's something hard for them to do. So we have a lot of different ones, young people. They're funny. I told one young person, I said, you do realize this is the same game, just different players. We've all played the same game. Who painted the horse paint? I don't know. I don't know who painted the horse paint. Okay. I often say this. When your child says, uh, when you ask them, who broke the lamp? Uh, they're trying to think of a good lie. They, they need time. Give me a second. Uh, you're getting ready to lie. All right? So, I learned that one from Judge Judy. So, one way or another, uh, no joke, man. Uh, how many of you enjoy watching her eat people up? Man, she is mean. Uh, anyway, so, she comes up, or we come up, and we look at these young people, and they say, I'll say, so what'd you do? The new answer. I don't know. That's a new one. Who did that? I don't know. It's like the cure-all. I don't know. Or this one. <laughs> or just the dead stare. Are you even in there? And you look at him like, is there anything going on behind those eyes? And then you got the straight out liars. Um, Samuel asked Saul, and Saul, he answers, but he doesn't confess that it's wrong. And we get those too. We get those with young people. Well, yes, but it needed to be done. But they were doing this. Well, you're trying to excuse away your sin. So we see another person and another question to those who make excuses about their sin. And maybe you're even doing that tonight. The Lord is touching your heart about a sin that you have been fighting in your life. And you're right now battling in your heart. There's nothing wrong with that. Well, who says there is? Who are you fighting with? And so we see that Cain or Saul was asked the question. And then we come back with Samuel and Saul. Saul never really learned his lesson. And Samuel came to Saul in verse number, uh, chapter 15 and verse 13. And Saul said unto him, and I love how Saul addresses Samuel with a righteous greeting. Hello, brother. It's good to see you, Samuel. Greetings in the name of the Lord. He acts all holy. It's self-righteousness. He's putting on a fat front. He's a hypocrite. That's not what we want to be. We want to be sincere Christians. Amen. We want to be sincere. But he couldn't be sincere because he was in sin. He disobeyed God. And Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. You notice he addresses his sin immediately and excuses it away. The first thing out of his mouth is about the Lord who he disobeyed. And the second thing out of his mouth is he tells him exactly what he did wrong. He lies about it. I did what I was told to do. Nobody asked you, but he's going to. And Samuel said, what meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in my ears, the lowing even, of lowing of the oxen, which I hear. And what Samuel immediately do? Guided by the Lord, he talks about his sin. If you're a believer tonight, God's going to talk to you about your sin. He's going to convict you. He is as a good father. That conviction's in there. If you are unsaved, he is going to convict you about being unsaved because he does not want you to go to hell. I don't want you to go to hell. He loves you more than I do. He loves you so much that he died on the cross for you that you could have what you could not provide for yourself, eternal life. He could provide righteousness, impute righteousness to you. When you couldn't do it for yourself, that's how much he loves you. 
And so tonight, maybe you're struggling with salvation, and he's asking you, why don't you get saved tonight? Are you going to be like Cain and excuse it away and deny him and lie to him and lie to others? Or are you going to just get that settled? Sister Leslie, I lived a long time lying to people about my salvation. I lived a long time doing it. Oh, I said words, and I played a part. But that's all it was. I played a part. Oh, hypocrite of hypocrites. Pharisee of Pharisees was I. Unsaved and undone. Oh, I would dress up and be part of the youth group and everything else. But in my heart, I knew I'd never truly receive Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. And then one day, I bowed my knee and I said, Lord, I'm, I'm done lying to others. I'm done lying to you. I know I'm not saved. Save me today. And it changed my life. And God gave Cain the opportunity to confess and repent. He refused. Without sounding too cliche, we can say that the apple did not fall far from the tree. Neither his father nor his mother took responsibility for their action when confronted by God either. So they followed suit. We won't delineate uh, personal accountability because we covered it in depth with the earlier lesson. It is important to see that this is a family trait that has passed down to all of Adam's descendants. And what am I saying there? It's passed down to you and me too. God has given us a remedy for this. 1 John 1, 9, written to the believers, we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Though the law was not established, Cain would have known that murder was sinful. Whether directly told by God, I'm sorry, that should have been a capital G, or by the directing of the Spirit, God has much to say about hatred and murder in the Scripture, and truly would not have hid that from mankind. So, Undoubtedly, the Lord would have spoke to Cain's heart, his mind. Cain would have known that it was wrong to kill. It would have been instilled in him, in his conscience. And I believe God would have told him because in Numbers um, chapter 35, all the way through uh, 3530 through 3540, um, he discusses that. And he, especially in 33, he talks about the blood, it defileth the land. And he directly talks about that with Cain, too. His blood cries out from the earth and cries out to me. And so he reiterates that in Numbers to the children of Israel. The death of Cain's murderous sin. Number one, he disobeyed God. Number two, he and his sacrifice were rejected. Then he was entreated by God to bring us the right sacrifice. I'll even give you another chance. Cain's anger raged in his rebellion. Cain's hate, Cain hates rejection and envies his brother. Jealousy grows in his, grows to hatred and moves him to murder. Murder did not lead him to hiding, but it did lead him to deceive. His parents hid. He just went on about business as normal. Isn't that strange? There's a big difference between Adam and Eve and Cain. Adam and Eve tried to hide from God. They were afraid. They were tempted. And Cain stood in the field. In my mind, daring God. I'm not hiding from you. I'm not ashamed of what I've done. Now, young people, when you get to the place where sh sin does not shame you, you better be afraid. Because God's judgment's coming. His judgment's coming. You might not even be listening tonight, but I hope you are. Cain stood in the field unashamed of his sin. It always scares me when we find a young person who, or, or middle aged or older, who say they're saved, but sin does not bother them. They never seem convicted because conviction only comes to the born again, to the children of the Lord. And so we look here and Cain isn't even ashamed of what he's done. His rebellion was directly to God. Adam and Eve were deceived. 
Cain rejected God, then God, that should not be Gad, um, rejected him. This is important to note that Cain rejected God's plan and brought his own sacrifice. God was rejected long before Cain was. Note that. Cain started to reject him. He's angry because God rejected him. No, Cain. You rejected God. This is you, Cain. This doesn't have to do with him. You brought a sacrifice that was not worthy. Psalm 78, 8. And might not uh, be as their fathers a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their heart aright and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. We don't want to be that stubborn and rebellious generation. That generation that isn't right with the Lord. A very convicting study because that rebellion, that stubbornness, lying to God, rejection of truth, it lies within us and we have to fight it every day. We're going to bow our heads, close our eyes, and end in prayer. But I want to give you an